Good morning. I'm going to be reading Matthew 6:25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek his first kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. when we hear this passage and this part of the teaching, it's applied sort of universally, right? Don't worry. That's good for everybody. Everybody can take that advice. Don't worry. Don't be anxious about those things. Uh, but I think often my experience of it is that then it sort of serves as a platitude, rather than a significant teaching. Oh, you've got your life sort of falling out from under you. Don't worry. Oh, there's not enough food to eat today. Well, don't worry. You're stressed or anxious about your job or your work situation. Don't worry. Your marriage is fraught. Don't worry. That's clearly not the application we're supposed to have for it, right? It's, it's more significant than that, but, but it can be used casually in a way that's hurtful and harmful, at least in the ways that I've heard it. So when I come to this passage, I almost have an instant stop. Mmm, I don't like that one. I don't like it as a platitude. I don't like it for the ways that it feels sort of uh, as like an excuse. Well, I don't need to do that because God will take care of it. I don't need to attend to those things. God will take care of it. Just sort of magic wand. God just fixes all the things. But that's not how it works, right? It's much more complicated than that. I have a friend from seminary who is pastoring in Jackson, Mississippi, where if you've been paying attention to the news, they have a problem where there's not access to water. The water isn't clean. And when I reached out to Lance and I said, hey, how are you? I'm just checking in. And he said, no, you know, it's troublesome and it's hard and it's complicated across the city. But the truth is we've been under a boil water mandate all summer. And we've been dealing with lead in our water like Flint, Michigan for years. It's not a new problem. There's just new awareness. Don't worry, Lance. God's got you. Not exactly helpful, 
right? There's more to it. So what do we do? How do we help? How do we see God at work? And I think there's multiple layers, right? People are bringing in clean water. People are bringing in bottled water, but there's also an infrastructure thing. And how do you change the infrastructure thing? Well, that requires funding, which requires legislation, which requires a vote. There's multiple layers to it, which means there's multiple layers where we are called to be part of a solution, not just pray for the people in Jackson who don't have clean water to drink or bathe in or brush their teeth, but to be a part of a solution. I think there's something bigger here that pushes on our need to be present, to be part of, and to be community. I'm going to share a couple of different stories that hopefully get us there. The first is about sort of how I ground myself with this passage um, to say it's more than just praying. It's more than just a platitude. And it started when I was a young adult as a camp um, counselor at Camp Colby in California. And the camps in California, the Methodist camps anyway, are not on the water. They're in the mountains. It's hot. It's dry, and there's a lot of dirt. That was my experience of it. It's 100 degrees outside, and there's fortunately often a pool, but not much else than that. But I go up there, and I grew up hiking, and I was always the slow, youngest one trailing in the back, and I would just catch up. And then everybody else would say, oh, good, we can keep on going. And they would take off again, and there I was trailing in the back. Uh, but by young adulthood, I had an appreciation for it. So when Rich Garner, who was the district superintendent serving as the camp pastor alongside Beside us, uh, said, I'm going to take the kids on a hike this afternoon, but I need another counselor to go with me. Is somebody willing? I said, sure, I can go with you. So at lunch, we tell the kids who sign up. It's an elective. They're not being forced to go. We say, okay, you know, after um, nap time, basically, you know, meet us here at two o'clock and bring a water bottle and your tennis shoes. So two o'clock, Rich and I are there. We have our water bottles. We collect this assortment of kids, junior high kids, so 12 to 14 years old. And uh, one of them brought a water bottle. We have about 10. Uh, one of them brought a water bottle and, we, you know, hem and haw. And it's before the day where everybody had a water bottle with them. So they should have one, but they didn't. Okay, well, it's only a mile up the canyon and back. It's a pretty easy hike. It's not terribly significant. They'll be okay. We can share a little bit if we need to. And so we take off dutifully and literally just sort of imagine two hills coming together here. Um, and you just go up the canyon. It's not a big deal. And so Rich leads us up to the canyon to this point that is not a destination. Uh, there's no waterfall, there's no lake, there's no creek, there's no vista, there's just like the end of the trail or a sign or something, and we turn around and we start walking back. Now, it's not rocket science. We went up the canyon to come back. We go down the canyon. It's fairly straightforward. Rich says, Debbie, do you want to lead? And I say, sure. It's a little bit more rocket science than I thought. And uh, so somewhere back in here... I missed a trail marker or something, and so I have us going this way. And it's getting to be a really long walk this way, but by the time we sort of check in about it, we're so far off that it's not worth going back. We're just going to keep on trucking all the way around, right? So we're over here. The kids drink all the water by half a mile that way, just right up, right? We're out. We don't have any snacks. There's no gummies. There's no nothing. It's just us out on this trail that's not particularly well-maintained um, and a bunch of 12 and 13-year-old kids who are delightful at this point in the hike, right? <laughs> All of my childhood karma coming right back to me. I'm tired. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I want to go any further. When are we going to be there? How much longer do we have to go? It was amazing. And there's the reality that here's where we are. There's nothing out here in the wilderness. We have to keep going. We have to get back. But the good news, kids, is that when we get back, there is food and there is water and there is rest. And, it, and we'll be fine, right? We're going to get there. And uh, this kid just sits. I don't want to go any further. I'm hungry. Oh, 
thirsty. I really hate to break it to you, pal, but God's not going to rain down manna from heaven over here for us. We got to get back all the way to camp. So he slides on his bum down the pine needles about 30 yards to make some good progress. I'm not sure you want to do that either, but you do you, and we'll get back to camp eventually. And so we just keep moving, keep moving. We're so far out of range that our walkie-talkies can't even check in to let people know where we are. Our 45-minute up and back hike took us about three and a half hours. It was amazing. And we got back to a lovely turkey dinner with mashed potatoes and gravy and, you know, pie and water. And these kids put food in their belly. And do you know how their story went? That was the best hike ever. We had so much fun. It was so good. Now, I tell you that story because there was a part of that moment there that said, you got to be part of your solution. Yes, God does provide. No, we don't have to worry, but God's going to provide over there back at camp, <laughs> not over here in the middle of the woods. We got to persist. We got to get through. We got to get over there. And I think that's very much a part of what we're invited to hear in this text is Jesus saying, God's going to provide and... We get to be part of the solution. We get to be part of what takes place there. And I don't hear it as a general teaching to everybody. I hear it specifically to the disciples. Jesus just out of the desert and the 40 days and the temptation, and he's taught a little bit, and he's teaching a little bit, he's preaching a little bit, he's healing a little bit. He's just called the disciples. That was our framework when we got started, right? Just a couple of disciples. And then he takes them away and sort of teaches them a few things. And I hear this as one of those few things, that these men that Jesus has called away from their homes, away from their jobs, away from their families, away from the familiar, sort of sit down and they're listening to him and they're processing Okay, and we're going to go here, and we're going to travel there, and we're going to travel there. And they start to say, well, but where are we going to stay? And, we're, well, if we're not working, if we're not fishing, what are we eating again? And what, what if something goes wrong? And what if something happens? Sort of litany of all of the potentials starts to come out. And I hear Jesus say to them this, breathe, <laughs> slow down. Don't worry about all of that. God is going to provide for us. And Jesus is the master illustrator, you know, out in nature, not sitting in a building, looks around and he sees the birds. Guys, look at the birds. They've got a nest. They're eating some worms. They've got some berries. They have needs and God provides for them. And look over here, and you see these flowers and how beautiful they are, and they just sort of flaunt in all their glory. Doesn't God care more deeply about us? God's going to provide for us. He's sort of calling them to just be grounded. God is providing. God is just offering us what we need. So when we go on this trip together, when we journey together, yes, God is going to meet our needs. It's going to be okay, but it's not going to be manna from heaven. We got to get there and then get there and get there. But the implicit there that isn't outright stated is there is where there's community. There is where somebody cooked a turkey dinner for you. There is where somebody set the table and put on some nice cool water. There is where somebody maintained this camp and there's a bunk bed for you to go lie down and rest in. There is somewhere where the community showed up. I think in Jesus telling the disciples, do not worry, what he's really saying is look around. All those people that we just spent our time with who were asking for healing and blessings and help and encouragement... They're going to be our answer. They're going to show up for us. They're going to provide for our needs. Is now, does that come from God? Yes, that's God working through people. But there's a both and there. There's a community there. And so as I sit with that, the notion of community, I find great joy Great encouragement, in large part because I work with community. And when I ask you, what's one of your favorite experiences of the church? 
Some of the time it's music. It's a highlight, right? But a lot of times what you tell me is when we were going through it, the church came alongside us. They stopped in, they made meals, they prayed for us, they took me to doctor's appointments, they helped with this, they carried that, they helped with laundry, they held the baby, they helped me with this, they helped with that, they came in and they raked my leaves, they cleaned my gutters. What you tell me is how the church comes alongside. I was going through it, it was impossible, I was terribly anxious and afraid and worried. And God gave me the gift of you. And I love that. I love that we can be community for each other. And I know we really struggle here too. We struggle here because culturally we are taught not to need community. Anybody else self-sufficient? We got it handled, independence. I don't need anybody. This is how I live my life. It's terrible misfortune, but it is who I am. So there you go. Um, and I'm a mom, which adds complexity to the layer. So that means I can hold at least one child, if not more, and do almost any other task at the same time. Right? And so then, like, when I do something else, and I've got chairs, and I've got this, and I've got books, and I'm bringing in something like this, and somebody's like, do you need any help? And I'm like, I'm a mom. I got this. Right? Like, who needs help with these things? We're, we're taught to be very, very self-sufficient, to not need anybody. And so when Jesus says, don't worry because the community has you. The community will come alongside you. There's more than a few of us that are like, oh, I don't need it. I can help somebody else, but I don't need the help. Anybody? Confession comes before communion. I'll let you handle that in your own private prayer time. Right? We struggle with it. I struggle so much that... Oh, it requires such vulnerability. For the community to come alongside us, they have to know what our needs are. And for them to know what our needs are, we have to be willing to tell them that we're struggling, that we're hurting, that we don't have it all together, that we made a mess of something. And none of us like that part. But it's an inherent part of this scripture becoming good news in our lives is allowing the community to know us so that they can know the need and meet the need. Because if nobody knows, nobody can help. And then there is a lot of worry because we're isolated, because we're lonely, because we don't know where the answers are going to come from, because we sort of get caught up in our own heads and we sort of stress ourselves out with all of the potentials and possibilities and probabilities, and there's nobody there to say, that's just not going to happen. We need the community. And I think that Jesus, as he called his disciples and sent them out to the world, wanted them to know that deep in their spirit, in their skin, in their pores. Every day, guys, you're going to have to look to somebody else to make you a meal. Every day, guys, you're going to depend on somebody else's hospitality so that you have a place to sleep. Every day, you're going to rely on somebody else's generosity of spirit so that you can make it through. What if we dared to shift our balance to be dependent like that? Why? <laughs> because it teaches us to be community. I would venture most of us don't want that. I mean, in theory, sure, but in practicality. What if it were required that we were fully dependent on others in order to be faithful disciples to Christ? How many of you would find a new religion? 
We struggle with this. This is not who we are taught to be in this culture, but it is who we are called to be as followers of Christ because we can't be the community if we don't know the community and we can't receive the gifts of the community if they don't know us. I'm gonna invite us to take baby steps. And a full confession, I struggle here, right? So you can hold me accountable as much as I might hold you accountable. Let the community come alongside. And maybe it just starts with an honest, vulnerable truth. How are you today? Will you answer honestly? How are you today? How can I support you? Would you let someone? Yeah. It's challenging, but I believe it's who we are called to be. Interdependent, vulnerable, and trusting that we can be authentic and not be rejected or judged, and that we can be loved enough to receive the grace that God offers. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus, for the ways that he loves us and teaches us. This calling to be reliant on others confronts all that our culture teaches us to be. And yet, in the vulnerability, there is true community. And in true community, there is grace and good news. Show us the baby steps so that we can receive your good gifts.